In terms of employment <coughs> services, I guess the, getting people into jobs, if you have a disability, getting people into jobs is a bigger problem than the employment service arrangements or the way employers behave. It's a social problem. It's that insidious way of discriminating by just having very low expectations. Oh, I don't think Billy could really work. You know, he's got a disability. Don't think he could. Well, actually, with support, people can contribute. Everyone has something to contribute. It's a matter of finding what it is and supporting them to do it. So how are we going with that? Well, we are taking the services who are supposed to be getting alongside Billy and helping that person discover what it is he's good at and getting him into a, a role that he can contribute in. What we're doing is saying, oh, while you're doing that, you might want to cut Billy off his support if he's not doing the right thing. We are rolling in the role of policeman to the role of advocate. I mean, does conflict of interest mean anything in these days? It's difficult to understand, really, how you could even think that that combined role is appropriate. So we have to, as a society, and we all have, we are all biased and, and have, um, I guess, blind spots about how we think. One way to break that down is to get alongside people who've got disability. It really quickly makes you understand that they're not actually that different. They're the same as us. They've got the same ideas, same needs. <laughs> They've got some limitations. I've got a lot of limitations personally. I haven't got time to talk about them, but <laughs> we've all got, you know, if you get someone with a disability, you go through reasonable adjustment. Now, you go and have workplaces, how many of them have got those stand-up desks? Now, how many people came and said, I will need a stand-up desk if you employ me? Well, if you're a person with disability, you do. But if you're anyone else, you don't. You just, everyone needs accommodations. So we make a big thing about someone with disability. They need serious accommodations. We're human and we're all different and we all need accommodations. So how, how would it look if we were doing the employment part better, the employment service better? Well, first of all, it would start in schools. So the low expectations really starts in schools. How we set up work experience for kids. You know, those kids with disability often get left back at school while the other kids go off and do work experience. How we then get kids jobs after school. Most kids have jobs after school. Kids with disability then need a bit of extra support to get those jobs, but they need to get them. If they don't get them, that's the start of thinking, I'm not part of this workforce. So schools is where it, where it starts. The next thing is the workplace itself. In a different life, I'm involved in um, homeless women. I'm on the board of this homeless women's service. And you know, we've got, there's been all this stuff about domestic violence, big contributor home, to homelessness for women. And one of the things we do is go into workplaces and run training and mentoring for employers and work place people about, you know, how do you recognise if someone might be experiencing violence and what might you do and what kind of conversations can you have and how do you support them? What? We don't do that for people with disability. And that's, why not? I mean, why are we not, why are we taking the individual approach which says, oh, you've got a disability, I will, as an individual, you come in and I'll set you up and we'll try and make these accommodations and it's going to get costly and we don't know if it's going to work. And, we should be talking to everyone in the workplace about, look, it's normal. Some people have got disability, some people are just cranky. We work with them anyway. And if you're a bit nervous, I mean, well, often people don't know how to talk to someone with disability. Like, you know, what can you ask? What can you say? Just have some frank conversations about that. That person is equally struggling to know how to engage with you. So employers need mentoring and support. Um, there's also, I guess, targets, and targets, you know, the affirmative action is sort of women's movement playground with targets for a long time. They've got, you know, there's pluses and minuses to targets. It's absolutely possible, though. So if you look at the Disability Insurance Agency, the body responsible for the NDIS, they employ 70% of their staff are people with disability. What do we find in government overall? Three, three and a half percent. Well, you know, that's not really much. I think we could do a bit better than that. So targets are certainly one way 
Another way I was involved in providing advice to the federal government about the workforce for the disability insurance scheme, and what we suggested and didn't find its way into government policy is that at least if you're not going to set targets, let's have transparency. If we are spending public dollars on providing disability insurance services, let's at least require those services to say what proportion of the workforce is, is a person with a disability. Now, I mean, that didn't get up as government policy. It's what you would minimally expect of a decent employer. So we should have a campaign that says, if you're a decent employer, be transparent about it. You have to report how many women you've got. That's still a requirement, I think, under this government, who knows? Um, but at least you could report that. And then when people are purchasing your service, they can make a decision about, is this the kind of service that I want to purchase from? I know that your time is very brief. I'm going to make a couple of comments about the training system. And I think you could just read the newspaper headlines to get the gist of it. But um, essentially, I mean, we are at risk of becoming a highly qualified nation and a totally unskilled nation at the same time. Remarkable. Fantastic. Um, one of the pernicious aspects of the way the training system works is, first of all, it's a wage subsidy. So if you go to an employer and you've already got a certificate three, they're going to look at you and say, you know what, I can't get that subsidy for you, so maybe I don't like you as much. So a certificate three bit of training is a noose around your neck if you don't make a good choice. And what's happening right now is that you've got a lot of training providers just saying, look, you know, we'll give you a free iPad. I don't know if they're still allowed to do that now. But, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll do this for free. It's not going to cost you anything. And how about you come on board? And it's, you know, art and botanical life, and it'll definitely get you a job. Um, and then you've got this problem that now you've got a certificate three, you're not going to get another one. Worse than that, they come back and say, oh, I've got another, you know, how to speak Zulu to Swahili people, and that's going to really, uh, that's going to really compete you for work. Um, and so you say, oh, okay, and you build up a hex debt to, to, to develop this training that is, so it's absolutely nonsensical. Um, there are some better schemes where training providers, providers have good connections to the sector that they're training in and to providing you with, with real placement opportunities. I mean, there's always a risk of that, that the training providers can become captive streaming agents of cheap labour. So, of course, you've got to worry about that. But having the ones that are totally detached from reality is, is I think, even worse. So there's no simple solution, but certainly the way it's working right now is, um, is disastrous in anyone's book. Um, so thanks very much for listening. Um, I guess I hope that I've um, <coughs> given a bit of insight into both bits, the unemployment bit and certainly people with disability, and uh, all power to you. Thanks.